So the particular thing that we're going to talk about today is what started out as the Kentucky Century Challenge and has since become the Kentucky Cycling Challenge. How many of you have heard of it before? Most of you. The Century Challenge started when I met with a friend of mine named Rachel, who was then the Executive Director of Preservation Kentucky. And they wanted to start a bike ride that had a century. And we were sitting in the Coffee Tree Cafe down in Frankfurt, and we're talking about, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could figure out a way to maybe do something that would get more people, let's see if I can make it work this time. I'll tell you what, can I just do this? Yes. All right, these are our, these are our logos. Um, wouldn't it be really cool if we could figure out a way, because she was worried about it being a new ride, and their idea was that they were going to move around in different towns every year for this ride to try to showcase small towns in Kentucky because they were Preservation Kentucky. What about if we tried to do something that brought together some rides um, and encouraged people to go different places? And so that was back in 2013, and it happened in, um, in about, so that was like in January or February, and they were going to do a ride that June. So I said, well, I know Rodney Hendrickson, Red Bud Riot, I'll give him a call. And she said, and I know the OKHP people, I'll give them a call. And so we got it all kind of configured there, and um, we all agreed that we were going to do it. We thought, you know, how many people are going to travel and ride four centuries a year? We might get 25 or 30, um, maybe 40 or 50, but we're not going to get very many. Surely we're not. Um, and then we talked to the state tourism cabinet, and they agreed to host our website for us. And so we were in action. Well, we opened registration. We really didn't do a whole lot of um, public or publicity of it. And within three weeks, we had 250 people signed up. Then we panicked, because it's like, these rides are all fundraising rides for the organizations that sponsor them. And we're not going to be able to afford to buy jerseys for all these people. So we scrambled around, and we got some sponsors, and we made it through. And so it's evolved over the years, and we've had different rides. I see Adam there. He was, he time was one of our rides, um, and he was really instrumental in that. And I think it was at the last bike summit that we met, right, five yes. years ago. Um, but we've had different rides that have, and that's really the point of it. The anchor rides ended up being um, the Horsey Hungry, which I'm affiliated with. And the Redbud Ride, which Rodney's affiliated with. And then our deal is that every three years we rotate the other rides, the theory being that it gives people a chance to experience other communities and it gives those communities a chance to showcase their rides and get people to come there. And I know that they're going to talk a little bit about how being involved in the challenge has helped their rides, but sometimes we're dealing with tourism people, which Jory and Rodney were then tourism people, and Rodney's also a cyclist. Sometimes we're dealing with cycling clubs like we did in um, E-Town, and sometimes we're dealing with um, government entities. And it's been interesting to see how the collaboration has evolved, evolved over time, because we didn't start with a grand master plan at all. So the way that it works is that participating rides are either have to contribute three to $5,000 or they have to come up with sponsorships. And of course, that's the dampening effect for a lot of people, right, is the sponsorships. That's a hard thing to do. And it's been interesting how that has um, evolved. And so we have been able, and one of our great sponsors for this year is right here, Capital Six Cycles in uh, London. Um, and they've been a real big help to us. But, you know, you get people that support you. Um, and so these are our partner rides for this year. The first four rides have already happened. Limestone Cycling Tour is coming up, and Paul is going to tell you a little bit more about that. And so we open our registration in January, and it's free. Anybody can sign up online. The only way to get one of these jerseys is to earn one. You can't buy one or if someone gives it to you. But why would someone give it to you when they earned it? <laughs> Maybe they would. Um, there's five rides. So these are the ways, and I'm not going to necessarily read this, but if any of you have questions. But it's amazing what people will do for a free jersey. Amazing. <laughs> They'll spend thousands of dollars, <laughs> travel all over the state if they can get the jersey. But it's also really cool because you, you can't get it without earning it, you know, if you don't do the rides. And so one of the really nice things that happened, I mean, and what we do is we have a check-in at the end of all the rides, and people come up and they show you their computers, and some of them can't write, and some of them can't stand, and if they don't have a computer, they can bring their friends. Um, and then we do a big Jersey distribution party where we do a celebration, and a lot of people come. Um, so it's kind of a cool thing, and it's been very cool for the state of Kentucky. So the annual budget is between twenty-four dollars and $26,000, that's to buy all the jerseys. And one thing that we did um, two years ago 
is we created a second level challenge. So there are a lot of people, like as you get older, you don't really want to ride centuries anymore. I mean, a lot of people in my age group was like, we used to do centuries and we don't want to anymore. So we started this 250 mile challenge, which is over the five rides, if you amass 250 miles, you can get a free jersey. And it doesn't matter how you do it. So if you want to start riding 30 miles and progress up to a century, you can do that. Um, all the rides have to offer at least a century and a metric century, which is 62 miles. And so people could do five metric centuries in the jersey. The reason we were able to do that is because of our additional sponsorships that came from, that I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, but it, it's been just really cool to see the collaboration of Kentucky-based companies that have been supporting this challenge and supporting tourism all around Kentucky. Um, we do have a backstop um, where if we run short of money, then the rides will kick in the money, but we've never run short. So normally, this is our jersey this year. This is the 250-mile <laughs> jersey. The 500-mile jersey says 500 right here, and the 400-mile jersey says 400 right there. If people ride all five centuries, they also get free bibs or shorts, and our jersey uh, producer this year is Primal, and they're throwing in free socks for those folks. Everyone else has the opportunity to buy bibs and shorts at our cost. So that's kind of the option there. So, um, I went too far. Well, I'll just leave it there. So, uh, AL8 signed on two years ago as our uh, primary sponsor, which is interesting. They're a Kentucky company, and before they did this with us, they had never done monetary sponsorships. They'd only done product. Seth from Kentucky Tourism hooked us up with them and said, you know, they're really looking to kind of get into the active market here in Kentucky, and they're looking for local things that they can sponsor. And so I went and met with them, and they agreed to sponsor us. And because of their sponsorship, and because of Capital Cycles coming on board as a sponsor, we were able to add, add that 250 mile challenge. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to do it. But what I said to ALA this year, because they came back on, is I said, let's do an ALA ambassador program. Because they say, people always ask us, can we get ALA bike jerseys? Well, they've never done them. So what we did is we put it out there and said, if you want to be an ALA ambassador, tell us why you deserve to be one in 250 words or less. And the, the uh, submissions were fabulous. I mean, they were hilarious. Some people wrote poems. Some people did videos. But anyway, um, they, they picked 21. And so they, they basically, the only thing they have to do with the jerseys, and these are the only people in the world that have ALA jerseys. <laughs> you all can buy one. After the set, we're going to make we're going to open it up to the public. If you really want an LA jersey, um, you can buy one pretty soon um, at, at our cost. Um, in any event, they go to the events, they take pictures, they use social media, they post on it's uh, hashtag LA proud. And so, you know, this is a really big benefit for LA, and they're having a great time. And you know, people know who they are, and they always talk to them on the rides and say, "Where do I get a jersey like that?" So it's been a really fun thing for. Um, and this wasn't an original idea I had. I was a sponsor for Pearl Azumi. I was a Pearl Azumi ambassador, and that's where I got the idea. I didn't make it up. But it really worked well for LA, you know, as a way to kind of, and they're also, we have um, a ride in Owensboro, and they're trying to break more into the Western Kentucky market, so they saw that as a good segue. So when you're trying to think of collaborations, you know, think of ways that you can benefit everybody. Um, and sometimes it's not all that obvious. And so the Department of Tourism was a really important partner. Of course, the state has no money, so they have no money, so they couldn't help us financially. But they do help us get the word out. They do help us publicize. They originally hosted our website until they, um, they did a revamp of their website, and our page was completely gone when we were getting ready to open registration, and they had no idea when it was going to come back, so now we are on website. Um, <laughs> But anyway, it's a great relationship with them because what we're doing is exactly what they're trying to do. And so that's been their involvement with us. And now I am going to turn it over to Rodney. I'm going to be back after a little bit and talk a little bit more about the Horsey 100, but Rodney is going to talk a little bit about the Red Butt Ride. Thank you, Pam. <clears throat> How many of you are familiar with the Red Butt Ride or have been there? Just about everybody. Um, I have one volunteer, actually the SAG driver, this is Kelly Burton, she's my replacement as executive director of the uh, Tourist Commission there. The Red Bud Ride started in 2008 with only 26 riders, and I think 24 out of the 26 were local. 
Uh, the following year wasn't much better, and the, the organi organization that actually owned and sponsored the uh, Red Bud Rides called London Downtown. It's our Main Street program, and they said, we're not going to do it anymore. We don't. It's not worth it. So my wife and I and another couple went to them and said, uh, if, if you'll let us organize it one year, we think we might can get 100 people. And we had 310 that year. And it's grown phenomenally uh, through the years. It, it's topped out at 1,400 cyclists. And they come from all over the United States. We usually get them from about 26 states and a couple different countries. We have them from Ireland, uh, Scotland. And this growth has been in spite of having the worst luck in weather <laughs> <laughs> of, the, of the 10 first years, four of those, we've had torrential rain. We've had a flood. One year we had snow flurries, we've had hail, and they keep coming back. And I think one of the reasons for that is we try to make it more than a bike ride. We have live music throughout the day. We have live music and a block party the night before. We have food, we have, we try to make it a bicycle festival instead of just a bicycle ride. Our community has really bought into the Red Bud Ride. Uh, we have community groups that sponsor each of the rest stops. We had over 200 volunteers this year. And when I mean community groups, the London Women's League does a rest stop. Uh, we've had, you know, just, uh, Rock Castle Revitalization to do a rest stop. Most all of our rest stops are, are themed rest stops. We've had uh, Hawaiian luau's, Kentucky <laughs> Derby parties. Uh, we've had uh, just all kinds of parties. It was interesting, the Kentucky Derby party, each uh, cyclist got a sticker that said, Talk Derby to me. <laughs> and they had, a, and they had a, at the Hawaiian luau, each cyclist had a lay. So we've had a lot of fun with it. It's been a, a true tourism event. When we run the zip codes on the registrations, over 96% of our participants come from more than 60 miles away. Only 4% actually come from Laurel and surrounding counties. Uh, Laurel County has um, 19 hotels and 1,300 rooms, and they, they fill them up for the rent. Right? It's a it's great economic uh, stimulus for our restaurants and hotels. Uh, it's grown to be a multi-county event. The actual ride takes place, it goes through three counties, the Century Ride. But we have also have a Red Bud warm-up the day before in Barberville down at Union College and a Red Bud recovery in Berea. So different communities are uh, adding on to this. One, one of the best economic, uh, I guess, advantages or uh, one of the best uh, assets that we've gained from this. A couple of years ago, we had a guy from, uh, originally from Johannesburg, South Africa, named Ian Hassel. Uh, this is his cousin and partner, Peter, here. Uh, Ian came to the Red Bud Drive. He also owned a bicycle manufacturing plant in Cleveland, Ohio. And they make custom handmade bicycles. When they make a bike, they're actually making them for the customer. It's not a, you know, off-the-shelf bike. Ian came to the Red Bud Ride and really fell in love with it and said, I want to move my plant to London. And we're very appreciative of that. And by the way, Capital Bicycles is also a very major sponsor of the Century Challenge, and thank you for that as well. Um, Rodney, you want to talk about this real quickly for me? Well, yeah, this is our growth through the years, and this is where we started with 26, and we've got around 1,400 registrations the last two years. But you can see where the challenge it was. You can, yeah, we had 779. Uh, right there, and look what a jump we had with the first year of the challenge. That was actually the first year that we went over the, a thousand riders was due to the century challenge. And that green one was horrible weather. Oh, the four <laughs> they, of, the, they four of those have been horrible <laughs> weather. <Yeah. laughs> but you know, this, this demonstrates the whole purpose of the challenge, which was to help these smaller rides in these smaller communities 
get more people to come. Thank, thank you, Adam. Thank you. Now, Ms. Joy Brown, she's a tourism director in Morgan. Um, I wanted to start with why did we sign on to do this? Because we're directly related, you know, directly involved with tourism, and we're not actually the organizers of the event. It's actually our local cycling club. Um, we thought, why can't we join the Kentucky Century Challenge? And that's what the bike shop wanted us to do. They, they kept pushing and pushing. And I think Pam was annoyed by me by this time it's all said and done, because I kept emailing her, how about now? How about now? How about now? <laughs> so this, is our, this was our third year in June of 2018. This is our third year, and we came off. This is our final year on this, um, the Century Challenge. So we're going to miss it terribly and going to start aggravating again to come back on it. But um, in all seriousness, as far as the, the success, we saw the success of this organization, and that's why we wanted to join, because not only did we become a trail town, we also saw the growth of saying bikes and people are walking, people are biking, and if we don't embrace that in the state of Kentucky, then we're going to be behind. And our community saw that as well. Keep in mind that we've not been doing it as many years as Rodney has been doing it. And we didn't have somebody like Rodney pushing behind this. Um, and our gr event grew. We started with 55 participants, and this year we ended up with 276 participants. So for a town that we only have 365 rooms, that's pretty remarkable. So if I had to, I was gonna put them in my house to stay the night, so. And those of you that know me, Steve Barber back there knows me, I probably would put them in my house to keep, to keep everybody together. But um, we had the conference center downtown, so we were able to do registrations there. We're the only one that doesn't do it outside, I think. Mm -hmm. we, do it, we do it indoors, um, we have a meal there, um, uh, LA came on, they're right there being able to hand out LAs to everybody as they come off. We're also known, have you ever ridden Bike Moorhead, any of you? We're known as the toughest heels, I believe. <laughs> the toughest climbs. We didn't choose any of the roads that are flat. <laughs> we chose all uphill. <laughs> and when people get to the top of our mountains, they're, they're relieved and happy. So we try to have happy people at the top of the hills at the side stop. So. Um, but like I said before, we're not the organizers of this event. That's actually, when we became a trail town, we got lucky enough that um, our orthopedic surgeon at the hospital opened a bike shop in town. He needed something to expand his hobby. So, <laughs> um, so he opened it and he said, we want to start this, and started talking with us. And we do sponsor their marketing and advertising for the event, but we're also a Kentucky Century Challenge sponsor. So we do both of that with the marketing and advertising. It has been a very worthwhile investment for us because pe places like Moorhead, our goal is to be put on the map, is what we're wanting. We're not a Lexington or Louisville kind of place. We want to be put on the map, and we're, we do have that interstate connection where we can be on the interstate. So that is a true test of what we can offer to everybody. And our local officials, it took a while, I'll admit, and that's just something that in your communities you have to watch for. It takes a while for your local communities to embrace it. Because after the first one, you can see on Facebook, which can be a hindrance or a help. On Facebook, you can start to see, well, why are all those bikers on the, sh on the road on Saturday morning? I'm trying to go to the grocery store. Um, they're not obeying the roads. And of course, Dixie's whole, um, by her whole law that she, I mean, not Dixie's law, but after Dixie put that in act, I met with the police department, so <laughs> it's gonna be wor worse with the complaining. But I truly think that people started to see if all these people are coming to town, they're staying in our hotels. And if they're staying in our hotels, they're eating our restaurants. So it's been an education part of it that we have went out and said, let's educate the community and say, why do we want to bring people to town? So if you have a shop in downtown Moorhead and somebody needs something, they're gonna stop at your shop, but find something else they want because we do good uh, merchandising. If, if that shop does good merchandising, they're gonna get gas, they're gonna eat, and they're gonna sleep. And that's a great thing that our organizers have done is they have people come in on Friday night and do registration. Some people drive in as early as Saturday morning, but nine times out of 10, I don't know, I, I, I'm not a cyclist, but I, I say you wanna eat or drink or something, so you're gonna stop and grab something. So that is a big test to see how that worked for us. Um, but like I said, we've got about 25,000 people as far as our last census report went. So this is a worthwhile cause. Because this is a late group. Yeah. Joy, I, I'm, I'm Bill, and we've, we've dealt, yeah. you, know, you guys have received bike commission grants, the Paul Grant 
the pulling eye grant that I spoke about earlier today. Um, could you talk about how you guys have integrated the concept of being a trail town and the enormous opportunity in your region for mountain biking? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, as part of the Paul and I grant, we put sharrows on our streets, and we also put bike hitching posts on our streets. And people um, in the neighboring town next to us is Olive Hill, which is also a trail town. They have hitching posts, a totally different kind of hitching post for horseback riding. So we have a hitching post for bikes. But what happened was, we have, we're attached to the Daniel Boone National Forest. And if you've ever been to Moorhead, they own more of our community than we own of our community. So they're up on top of the mountain was Limestone Knob, the highest point in Rowan County. And as a trail town, we're supposed to build trails and expand the recreation opportunities. Well, this same bike shop and the same volunteers from there started building mountain bike loops at the top of the Limestone Knob so people could go up there and see them. And what happened during that time is Right next to Cave Run Lake, there was a loop trail that used to be there for, for years and years. And it became murky and muddy and the Forest Service ran out of money and couldn't fund it to fix it. And so now we moved them all up and migrated them out of there so they could start to recover itself. They're using those loop trails before they were ever done. They were just riding on them before they were ever completed. It's now growing into that mountain biking mecca because we're known as a Kentucky Trail Town. And that, it, it's the same thing with anything. With the Kentucky Trail Town certification, we didn't receive money for it. We just received the certification for it. But the opportunities that it lended itself to was help us expand our economic growth to increase our infrastructure because these people are spending time in their towns. But it also opened the eyes to see that's not too far from Lexington. We can go up to Moorhead and we can ride our mountain bikes. These trails are tremendous. I mean. I've, I've went up on some of them. Of course, I've got the benefits of riding with the Forest Service at the top of some of them. But the views are incredible and the riding is spectacular. Yes. And they dry out better than any place in Lexington. Yes. <laughs> and because of the hills, what's the status of electric bikes on those mountain trails? That's something we talked about, as a matter of fact, in a meeting on Tuesday. We talked about that with the Forest Service, and that is something that for the first time in 20 years, maybe 25, they have decided to start exploring that option. Okay. And because we, every time that something happens on the Forest Service, we have to ask the Forest Service for permission. The new thing with the Forest Service is while they don't have any money, they're looking to expand their partnerships. And that's where that public-private partnership comes into play. So they're saying, hey, wait, that might be an opportunity. So that was the first time I'd ever heard somebody go, yeah, let's talk about that. So I thought, I'll write that down and I'll do like I did Pam and aggravate him to death. <laughs> <laughs> right, so. you want somebody to enter in those conversations, uh, make sure I I'll get, get hooked up to you, with you this next two days, yeah. absolutely. This is the bike shop. This is right on Main Street. And this was one of our, this was actually what we were certified as a, we, we were doing, you have to do a trial run before you're certified as a trail town. And this was the first thing we did. And these guys, this is our organizer, one of the organizers that initiated the bike warhead and then one of our trail captains that actually does all the work on the trails. So, um, but I'm the crazy guy, or crazy guy, crazy gal that's standing on the side of the road when I see bikers coming through waving like a crazy woman. They're probably trying to figure out how to get out of Moorhead, but I'm so excited to see them because these people don't look like they've got a lot of big purses on their arms, but they got a lot of money to spend in your community. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thanks, Joy. Uh -huh. um, so what's going to happen, we've got a little bit more than 20 minutes left. Just keep asking questions as you need to along the way, but I'm going to turn it over to Paula, who's, this This is their inaugural um, ride with the Century Challenge, so, or the Cycling Challenge, so it's their first time. And then I'm going to talk about an, impact, an economic impact study that, that was done in Georgetown around the Horsey 100, so I can show you guys the, the benefit of something like that. And then Paula's going to show you a video at the very end. Okay. <laughs> um, like she said, this is our first year uh, as part of the Kentucky Century Cycling Challenge. It is our 10th year to have a ride, so it's just going to be a bigger scale. We, Rodney's been to our ride, several, maybe some others have been um, over in Maysville, still uh, rides with us and things, but we do have a bike club. Uh, we now hit 50 people, but we have a uh, key six or seven of us that are on the committee that um, chair the event every year. And Leroy Gallenstein, one of our local doctors in town for three years, is like, Paula, oh, we've got to get in the Century Challenge. We've got to get in the Century Challenge. Like, 
Okay, so let me see what we can do. And I know, I've talked to Pam Thomas. All you gotta do is just call, call Pam. <laughs> so I was kind of like Joy, and I started bugging Pam, like what's the process, what do we need to do? Um, and then like she said, the backing, the, the sponsorships, again, we're, we're 50 or less members, we don't have the pockets in our club to come up with the sponsorships. So I seeked out to our um, tourism department and said, hey, this is the information that I gathered from Pam and from Rodney and from Joy um, of how it impacted their communities. Can we give it a try? You know that we've brought in other people just in smaller numbers. So tourism was on board and they said, let's get the fiscal court because we're going out into the counties. So I solicited um, both of those entities and we came up, they're, they're two of our big sponsors as well. Mm -hmm. They both kicked in $2,500 uh, to be sponsors of all five rides to get their name out, Maysville and Mason County across the state. Because our key thing and how I sold it to them, I guess, and what we truly as a bike club are saying is that yeah, it's one event on September 15th this year, but we want people to come back. We want people to come back and ride our area in Mason County and the surrounding counties. So this year, our 100 milers and our metric, we have four routes. We're going into Bracken County, uh, Lewis County. I mean, we're, these are all these communities. Augusta, themes, talk about themes. And if anybody know who's from, um, Augusta, when our George. theme, that's right, we got a Clooney theme, <laughs> and Augusta, so there's one reason to come and see, so, so that's the fun thing, we get communities involved, we get lots of volunteers, we've got a volunteer group in Mace Lick, or another little community in, um, in Mason County, so that's the exciting part of it. Um, we're also uh, downtown, uh, we have a beautiful downtown, if anyone's, we're right along the Ohio River, um, yeah, we have flood walls, but they're, they've got beautiful murals on them. Um, we have a bison statues now that are new at Limestone Park where we're our start and finish. So we're pretty excited about bringing more people. And one of the impacts, let me say really quickly, like I said, this is our 10th year to do this. Um, our pre-registrations, the max that we've had for pre-registrations typically is around 40 or less. Like Rodney said, you know, you're, you're kind of like building up the numbers. And what our goal is, like everybody, it's a charity ride and we keep our costs as low as possible. And we're always was able to raise four or five thousand dollars for our charity um, with ha only having, you know, smaller numbers. The max that we've hosted is 80, 80 some people, 80 some riders. Right now we've got four and a half weeks to go and we've got nearly 300 pre-registrations already. So that's the impact. Yeah. So follow us on Facebook. I mean, that's a key. Facebook, Twitter, all of those things. Um, we're out there trying to get the word out, and we, you know, social media is a big key. So, thanks, thanks. Um So as I said at the beginning, this is one example of a multi-community collaboration that moves around over time. But it doesn't have to be limited to cycling or the kind of things we do. We, we're doing. I've often thought about trying to do a similar thing for mountain biking. I don't have enough time and energy to do it, but um, I wanted to say just a little bit before I move on to the Horsey 100 about the Owensboro ride, which was, this was their second year with us. And this year from, last year was their first year, and they are the flattest century. We're all pretty hilly, <laughs> all of us, because we're on the river. Owensboro's pretty flat. And so last year from our club, I think 40 people went to that ride, and then everybody came back and talked about how flat it was and all of that. And this year, 95 people just from our club went. And they all stayed overnight, two nights most of them. So, you know, and it also increased their attendance fourfold. So this is really, it's, it's had momentum and it has made a difference for these communities. And I think that people will go back because they go and have a great time. Like who knew that Owensboro had done so much work on their riverfront? It's really cool. And they had these Friday night events down there and everybody was like, oh, this is great. I want to come to Owensboro. And they've got mountain biking trails too. So anyway, it's just a good way to think about you know, how to, how to benefit each other and work together in ways that matter. So just as a matter of scale, Paula talked about their club, 50 members. We, the Blue Rest Cycling Club, have 1,000 members. Um, 
the Horsey 100 is the biggest event ride in Kentucky. We had about 2,400 riders on the road this year. Um, and we, it's a, it's a huge scale operation. I was the director of that for a couple of years, and now I'm the president of the BCC. But um, we host at Georgetown College, probably most of you, if you're cyclists, have, have been there. We get incredible response rates to our surveys um, when we do rider surveys, and we take those into account in planning our ride. Our ride is a true event. We have a live band on Friday night. We have community events on Saturday night. We have a big vendor expo. Um, and so it's, it's on a different scale. And honestly, doing the um, challenge wasn't going to help us that much. But we felt like it was a way for us to help cycling across the Commonwealth. Because the other thing that happens is when you get the women's club or the Rotary Club or the Lions Club to staff your rest stops and they meet cyclists, and they learn that cyclists are people too. It helps to, I mean, seriously, they're not just people that are out there annoying you on the road, but they're real people who have children and grandchildren and live in our communities. It helps to build goodwill. And so we viewed it more as a way to kind of reach out in the state of Kentucky and help other events, because it, it really hasn't, it really hasn't piqued our registration much at all. We have riders from 37 states. We have a couple hundred riders that come every year from Canada and also Michigan. It's like a big thing for them, and they all stay in the college dorms and pretend they're in college again. <laughs> um, but the city of Georgetown did an e had a University of Kentucky do an economic impact study a few years ago just on Scott County. So they didn't look at Lexington, they didn't look at Frankfort, they didn't look at any of the surrounding counties, they just looked at Scott County. And so um, and that is an important thing if you can think about doing it because as far as I know in Kentucky for cycling events, this is the only economic impact study that exists. But I think one of the good ways, in, especially if we start advocating in Frankfurt, which we don't have an advocate, we are one of the few states that do, doesn't have a cycling advocate organization and we're, we're way behind from a legal standpoint in my opinion because of that. Because legislators are not confronted with cyclists very much, except for Dixie Moore who moved the sun and the moon and the earth. Um, but anyway, um, we're at a deficit for that. And so having this kind of information, economic information, fiscal information, is something that you can take to policymakers and elected officials and say to them, look, this really matters. It's like what Joyce said. They're willing to invest money in the bike ride there because they know that it has long-term effects. And so we can't just say we're happy bike riders and we want you to welcome us. We have to show people why there's a benefit for having us there. Mm -hmm. I have a question. When you talked about your rest stops mm -hmm. and how you pulled in different organizations, so for a century ride, are how many minimum rest stops are there within that route? You like to have uh, rest stops at every 15 to 20 miles, not any longer than that. And we have 360 some volunteers for the Horsey 100, but we have a two-day ride over the course of the weekend. And then our planning committee is about 27 people um, and it's so when we meet year-round um, we have we're, we're completely volunteer which is best I can tell for a ride the size of our ride um, almost always the director is paid and it takes a lot of time I can tell you from uh, personal experience but we are a completely volunteer run ride but as you can see here this was just the weekend and just in Scott County $623,000 their hotels sell out. Lexington hotels near the vicinity sell out. There are no hotels in Woodford County, so they don't sell out. Um, but got, people, got one now. yeah, that's Holiday right. And just over that's there. right. Um, which I live in Woodford County, so I can say that. Um, but if you can show information like this for a, for a community the size of Georgetown, this is very significant. Um, and the professor that did it at UK, I don't remember his name, but my husband Randy, who's here, he knows. And so if anybody is interested in it, we can get you that information. But um, I can't emphasize enough that if you want to get the legal support, which you need, and you want to get the community support, then we have to kind of break down the barriers so that people see cyclists as people, so that they interact, so that folks understand. Um, and if you can show a fiscal impact, people care a lot about that. Bill? Pam, could you talk about the efforts you went to successfully to engage the police community? So, um, yes. We um, at the Horsey 100 did not really um, integrate with the police a whole lot, and we had a tragedy a few years ago on our ride. And after that, we knew we needed to do a better job of 
integrating the police into our planning. And they have become integral planners with us now. And there's this thing called, I don't remember what it's called, backstop or? Backups. Backups. That everybody in this area, except for Fayette County, belongs to. And it allows police officers to cross jurisdictional lines and have authority in other counties. And so um, Chief Bossy, who's in Georgetown, coordinated with all the um, officers and all the police departments from all of the um, communities that we go through. And we have an incredible police response now. We have them at major intersections. They, um, we have a team that works with them. They had a helicopter um, last year. And I can't emphasize enough, and especially with our rider feedback, seeing the police makes them feel safer. And so we have some that are just riding around. We have some at the intersections. Um, and, and I can't emphasize enough how supportive they've been of the Horsey 100 in, in helping us take that to the next level. Um, are there any other questions or anyone that has comments or maybe other collaborations that you've worked on, um, things you're interested in? Or Austin? Well, while we're talking about police and security and safety, that sort of thing, were those groups doing that out of the goodness of their heart or on a pro bono basis, or is that something that uh, they were hired to do? It's a combination. Okay. Um, Woodford County donates, uh, Georgetown donates, we pay Franklin County. Um, and, and really, it's we pay the sheriff's department to stand because we cross 127 a few times, and so we just pay their hourly rate, but we work through their departments to do that. So some of them, uh, and sometimes it changes from year to year. Like we have paid Woodford County in the past, we didn't pay them last year. So um, it's, inter it's important though to start working with them fairly early to understand what your logistics are and what they need to do and where you need people. Mm -hmm. Would you like for me to touch on that a little bit? Sure. So I'm the police operations captain at the University of Kentucky Police Department here in Lexington, and we have uh, motor units, so motorcycle units that we were actually able to, one year we were able to go pro bono, one year we had a discounted rate, one year we had to charge full, but it's all reflective on what our budget allows and doesn't allow. Um, I know you work with Captain Matlock considerably, he's a member of uh, Bluegrass, um, and I'm a commuter here in Lexington, so, so we're sympathetic to the bicycling community, and we try to do the best that we can, but generally it's the relationships with the stakeholders and explaining to them how important it is to their area. You would be surprised what type of assistance you can gain mm -hmm. from that. And they've also been very helpful to us in rerouting some stuff. Like we, we would route a certain way and then they would say, no, we think it's safer this way and this is why and we'll give you protection. And so we've, we've done some rerouting based on advice from them. So I can't emphasize mm -hmm. enough how important that partnership is. Did you have a question? I, just, uh, I thought you mentioned that there's not a statewide bicycle advocacy group and it just connected in my mind that there is a group called Kentuckians for Better Transportation, mm -hmm. which is a advocacy lobbying group supposedly for all modes of transportation, but they represent highway, they represent aviation, they represent waterways, they represent public transit. I've but not I've seen looked, anything. I'm on their board of directors um, by virtue of my position. But I've lamented the fact that they do not represent bike and pedestrian issues. I don't know if that's something we could explore and maybe see if KBT would be open. If, if they truly want to be a Kentucky for better transportation and represent all modes, if they would be open to, to including some bike head representation on their... That makes their, perfect their sense to me. Uh, thanks, Pam. Uh, first off, a shout out to uh, Peter for being a sponsor of our Hub City Tour this year. And on the safety uh, theme, one of the things that we have not advertised it up to this point because it's a recent uh, discovery for us, but all of the riders who uh, care to carry a cell phone with them on a ride, and I guess one or two people probably do, uh, but anybody who has a cell phone with them on the uh, Hub City Tour will have access to a chip so that we'll know exactly where they are at any time of the day. Cool. On the route or off the route, yeah. so if anybody can't read a Dan Henry arrow, we can still track them down. So if anybody wants more details on that, it's surprisingly easy to do. Uh, I'm easy to find. I'll be wearing the bull moose colors for two days, so uh, just uh, Thanks, grab a hold of my yeah, I have one last question to come in. I talked about the police, but you've been very successful in engaging the small communities along the way. For example, stamping ground. Mm -hmm. Could you share? developing those relationships and what a difference that's made. How many of you have been to Stamping Ground? So Stamping Ground, if you've been there recently, they've got bicycles all over their town chained to their poles, just these old bikes that they've painted with baskets and flowers. And um, 
we do try to engage the communities that we go through for several reasons. One is the public relations stuff I was talking about before. Two is we want them all to know, and we try to, I mean, we, we were on all the Lexington news stations before our rides to say, these are the roads we're going to be on, and this is when we're going to be there, and if you're going to be annoyed, go another way. You know, because we don't want drivers to get annoyed. Um, but the small communities have been crucial because they do these, you know, the community volunteers, like in Stamping Ground, we had the fire department. They were doing that stop. And it was the first stop, so a lot of century riders don't stop at the first stop. So one of the guys was out there waving them down saying, you got to stop, you got to stop, we got that big. But we really try to do that. And it also helps to bring the communities together. Not just the cyclists, but also the community. So you know, anytime people can do stuff together as a group, it helps to develop the community. That's what community is. It's people working together as a group to accomplish goals. And so that's really what I see the challenge as, even though we're all over the state is that we're a group of people working together um, to accomplish a goal, several goals really, that benefit a whole lot of people. Um, we, have, we have time for a couple more questions and then Paul is going to show you a very quick video to end up. Go ahead. Just go back one more to the police security. You mentioned the term backups. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's only during that event? Like no. a specialized that's, that's 365 days a year. Yeah. Okay. So um, I live in Lexington, but I'm representing uh, Mount Sterling today, and we are working on our own kind of trail system through uh, state funds and grants and things. But you know, we're looking at expanding these opportunities. Are, how do we? I mean, we don't have a cycling group because we're a very small community. We don't have a bike shop. But we're very connected to recreation, gorge area. What? How do we get started? Like, I would what talk do we to do? Joy Brown. Okay. Yeah, do what I can. Absolutely <laughs> great. Who's your name? Talk to the folks from Winchester. Yeah, like connect. But you know, is there is there like a a how to start a start a ride? You know, um, not that I'm on, like, aware of, synergy. but there are a lot of ride directors who are very willing to help and offer advice. Yeah. Troy like Hearn. you could talk to Troy me. Hearn. Yeah, I think like, would also be helpful. Yeah, yeah, Troy Hearn would be really helpful. Troy, if you ask Troy Hearn for information, he'll send you 75 attachments. <laughs> <laughs> Everything yeah. you've ever wanted. Yeah. It's too much. <laughs> and if you attend some of them, yeah. yourself or people that are involved with it, yeah. pick their brain. There, ever any cyclist is willing to share the information. I mean, probably the most sophisticated operation is the horse because it's the biggest event and it has the most moving parts. But I've organized everything from that to the Savory Cycle, which is a small event that raises money for broke spoke. So I mean, I'm happy to talk to you about that too. Yeah. Um, I think that's it. I'm going to let Paula show you the video. Yeah. And the reason I'm just going to show you the video is, you know, we're talking about getting the word out. And I think that's a key thing of anybody organizing a new ride or whatever, and social media, I mean, a lot of it is, it can be free, <laughs> you know? Um, this was uh, done by um, a drone, but it was by a friend of a friend, mm -hmm. and he put it together, and so it's just a little quick video. That's on the challenge in just a minute. I forgot to tell you any of that stuff. And I'll do it very quickly because we're not done.
Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Kentucky Cycling Connection series. The Kentucky Cycling YouTube channel is a volunteer effort aimed at promoting cycling in the bluegrass region. You can support this work by sharing the videos on social media. Also, please like the video on YouTube and subscribe to the channel. Thanks.